It's great uh, that that uh, you made it. Uh, we are so thankful uh, for uh, for your interest in participating in the uh, 250th uh, symposium, our anniversary symposium. And uh, without further ado, I'm just going to introduce uh, my colleague Rajiv Vora, who is going to uh, introduce you. Okay. Thank you. So, Rajiv. Okay. Uh, hi, hi, Ken. Um, I I know your um, eager to get started, but uh, I'll just stay a couple of minutes here. Um, right. So it's a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Kenneth Barrow. Um, it's a bit of a superfluous task, really. I, I don't know anyone who's unaware of his many breathtaking contributions in economics from uh, general equilibrium to social choice, to health economics, to information economics. Um, he's um, There's hardly a field in modern economics that doesn't have Ken's fingerprints on it. Uh, in fact, uh, it's fair to say I think that he deserves many more Nobel Prizes than the one uh, that, he, that he has received. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, one indication of, of, the, um, of, of that is, is that he also has the, um, I think, uh, the probably a rare distinction of having a number of his students who have gone on to win uh, the Nobel Prize. I, I, I'm sure somebody is keeping um, keeping score on this, but I know that that there are several of his students who've won the Nobel Prize, and and that's another indication of his of his influence. Um, I shouldn't um, take too much time because I know Ken is Ken is eager to to start, and you know if I were to actually go through his list of accomplishments, we'll be here for a very very long time. But let me end with just a couple of uh, things. One um, that. Um, you know, he has not only been sitting at his desk and writing um, and proving theorems in economic theory, he was also uh, a member of uh, the Council of Economic Advi uh, Advisors for, for JFK. Um, and, and the last thing I wanted to say is given the interest of this symposium in von Neumann, uh, among the many, many uh, awards that Ken has, one of them is the John von Neumann Theory Prize. Um, and uh, I think uh, I should just... Uh, uh, let uh, Ken uh, give us his wisdom. So Ken, you're, 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 you're going to be next. Very good. Thank you very much, Professor Bora. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to be giving not a, a, a set of results, which I think is inappropriate to the occasion, but rather some very broad considerations on problems that arise in economics and to a considerable extent in all the social sciences. Um, issues which, uh, on one hand, clarify the, uh, the uh, areas of research that have been undertaken and should be undertaken in the future, and the other hand, pointing to uh, difficulties intrinsic in uh, achievement in this field. Uh, let me just start by, I'm going to be using quotes, so let me start by one. Um, with, uh, in regard to Brown University, uh, a very famous uh, Boston physician, uh, essayist, and all-around accomplished person, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., I'm sorry, said, little of all we value here wakes on the morn of its 100th year. But Brown is waking on the morn of its 250th year. So I must offer my heartiest congratulations to such a great accomplishment. Now, the title I used is How the Future Influences the Present. And uh, let me start by analyzing, by uh, at least remarking, on the uh, uh, situation in which the present and future were discussed, and that's in Hamlet, uh, Act 4, Scene 4. Uh, this is a passage which is almost invariably omitted in the stage presentations of Hamlet. Uh, it, uh, it's certainly not one of the most famous scenes. It is, uh, it only appears on the few occasions when somebody's put on an incomplete, an uncut version of Hamlet, um, which I once had the fortune of seeing. Uh, in Act 4, Scene 4, Hamlet is on his way to a seaport. He's been sent by the king to go to England. Actually, the king is intending to use this as a way of getting rid of Hamlet. Um, 
and of which Hamlet is unaware of. Hamlet himself, on the other hand, has been apprised of uh, by the ghost of his father that the, that he had been king by the, killed by the present king, which was uh, his uncle. Uh, he uh, feels uh, that the evidence of the, of the ghost wasn't enough, and he actually arranged an empirical study um, to test the conscience of the king. Uh, the, the play, the play's the thing which will catch the conscience of the king. And play uh, a play, a suitably doctored play with reference to the alleged events was presented and the king's uh, reaction convinced Hamlet. So now he has the evidence. Um, on his way to the port, he encounters an army. The Norwegian army is crossing Denmark with permission to fight a war against Poland. I'll leave the improbability of these events to one side. Um, and encounters uh, a captain who tells him what the campaign is about, about some disputed territory. So, he's, uh, and he said, huh, said so. Uh, he said he would he would pay nothing. The, the captain said he would pay hardly anything for the right to, to that territory for himself in terms of its economic value. And uh, Hamlet then says, "Well, the Poles won't defend it then." No, no, they're all prepared to defend it. And in fact, the ground over which they're fighting will not be big enough to bury the dead in the battle. Uh, a good example of irrationality. The captain leaves, and Hamlet has a soliloquy. Um, and he makes this following statement: "Sure, he that made us with such with large discourse, looking." before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reasoning to fust in us unused. In other words, we can look before and after, we can look to the past, and we can look to the future. And we you must use that in order to uh, guide our actions. Well, he has looked to the past already, uh, in, in the sense of testing the ghost's prediction. So he has some evidence uh, to, for his aim, which is, at this point, to kill the king, to kill the, his uncle. Um, so he now said, but what the rest of the reasoning might uh, not strike us today as quite so uh, reasonable, because what he deduces is not war is useless, which might be a reasonable conclusion from uh, the captain's remarks about the value of the land being fought over. Uh, it's not, he doesn't, uh, uh, that they might say, well, maybe I should, all this hatred is not, is not worthwhile. We're not going to uh, accomplish anything. You might reason with that's exactly the opposite of what Hamlet concludes. Because what he says is rightly to be great is greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honors at the stake. So he has a, his utility function then. Uh, honor is a very dominant consideration. Um, and uh, uh, that, so, and he points, and his point is precisely that this Norwegian army is going to fight not for any economic value, as uh, uh, narrowly conceived, but for honor, for the right to, to, uh, uh, to this land which, they, which, they be which belongs to them. There's a theme which we find echoing today and, and in, in the past century in the wars we have fought. So from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or nothing worth. That's the end of his soliloquy. All right, the point I want to emphasize is the role of the future here. He's looking ahead to the accomplishment of his aim, what is going to be gained by it, by namely honor in his case. The, uh, the, the honor and the honor of his father, of course, um, not to mention his mother, it's another, it's another part of the story. Um, and we find, in general, that human beings, and, there, and of course, no doubt, many animals, too, and many other parts of the, uh, the zoological world, um, have actions which are, which are based today on consequences 
in the future. Um, now, this is uh, you may say almost a truism, but I notice in some sometimes methodological discussions with uh, fellow uh, scientists in the in natural sciences, a big difference. Um, the this is it's as if the particles we're studying, or let's say the planets we're studying in, a, in astronomy, or the particles in particle physics, are um, uh, think. They look ahead. They may even react to what we do um, uh, in, in anticipation. And this is the big difference between the, uh, the sciences of the human, what used to be called the behavioral sciences, psychology and the social sciences, is different. We think of the behavior as forward-looking. Um, so, of course, in economics, we're accustomed, of course, to the familiar list of things, savings. You, you're going to live tomorrow, so you want to, you want to be able to live, let's say, after retirement. Um, investment, on the other hand, uh, I have a good idea to make money, but it involves production in the future. Today, I have to put up my buildings or buy my machines or trade or, and of course, education. And we may even consider, as I'll come back to later, other people, bequests. If you assume they have family values and then a desire to consider the future of the family rather than merely my own future, the uh, one wants to consider uh, present actions like refraining from consumption in order to build up bequests. Education, of course, uh, is, uh, as illustrated by Brown University, is, of course, another example uh, of this. We get educated. Uh, not, uh, not only to train ourselves, but to be um, responsible people, people who appreciate the arts and the, the humanities. But whatever it is, these are future, whether it be for the point of view of self-knowledge and self-learning uh, uh, and self and pleasures of the mind, or whether it be training for a uh, some particular trade, or profession, uh, in, any, in, any, in any case, it is future-oriented. We expect the returns to be in the future, and we're making certain actions today, which may or may not be pleasurable in themselves, in order to achieve these aims. And even things like exercise or vaccination may fall into the same category. Now, in coming in, just zeroing in on the economy, and not talking about other uh, social sciences or uh, psychology, uh, we would talk, what is it that shapes and determines our economic actions? What we buy, what we sell, what we make, what, uh, what, uh, what, how much we devote to, to labor, how much we devote to uh, uh, other forms of activity, investing at the time you spend investing, whatever. Uh, well, we put in economics, as opposed to the other social sciences, we have one particular system, maybe the price system. In a way, uh, functionally, one point of view certainly about prices is that they convey information about others that you do not possess. It's if I uh, want to know, if I want to acquire, acquire something, I want to buy something, the, the others have to d sacrifice themselves in some ways, devote time and energy to meeting this uh, need of mine. Um, so if I'm uh, considerate of others, I would want to know how much they put in. But I don't really have to. All I know, know, need to know is the price that I'm being charged. And relative prices uh, determine our actions. Uh, the, the, but they're kind of a substitute for information. However, as we do find, observe very quickly, uh, if we're future-oriented, we'd like to know the prices that will prevail in the future. And that it's certainly obvious enough if I'm educating myself for a trade, I have to consider what income I will get uh, when I complete this uh, learning process. And the, uh, uh, the so, but, so I'd like to know what the, not the wages today, in that field, 
but what the wages will be when the time comes. You know, it could be if it's a, you know, you have obvious sorts of things. If wages are high today, people may project this to the future. A lot of people may enter. And because that so many people enter, wages, in fact, will be low. And that has been a preoccupation of economists, at least since the 30s, uh, considered to that time. There's a further consideration. Uh, we can't really know the future, even ideally. Uh, we can't know all the factors. Uh, we don't, don't have, uh, and there is, there is there's a fundamental uncertainty about the future. There's even, in fact, uncertainty about the present and the past. We don't know, as we know uh, all about the past by any means. History is continually being rewritten. Uh, as anybody who's gone to look at this uh, will know, new discoveries are made about the past. Certainly, archaeologists uh, and uh, will keep on uh, making new discoveries. And uh, so, we, even the past is uncertain. Even the present is uncertain. There's an occupation now known as nowcasting. How do you, supposing you have access to a reasonably large amount of data today, how do you fill in the gaps? The things. We don't know what's happening today. We want to know transactions elsewhere in the economy, say, to, for forecasting purposes. So we don't even know today. But certainly, if we're planning for the future, we do not know what the future will bring. And one uh, of all the uncertainties, one of the biggest uncertainties, in fact, is uh, the uncertainties about future technologies. We don't know what we will know in the future. We, we are certainly over and over again exposed to the fact that uh, new developments, sometimes they require new scientific advances, sometimes they're merely applications, new applications of old and well-known scientific principles give rise to new products. We're continually getting new products, sometimes just imaginative reassortment of uh, existing facts, sometimes uh, uh, involving genuinely new principles. And uh, we find that these are uh, play a, a major role. So we don't know, uh, for example, if I'm going to be in, in the, uh, take a classic example, in the 1880s or 1890s, and I want to go into the buggy whip industry, I would like to have known that automobiles are going to come along and make that profession somewhat, that industry somewhat obsolete. Um, but we know, there is, we know that... Uh, uh, that there will be innovation, that there has been innovation, certainly on a, on, a, on a significant scale throughout history, but certainly on a very rapidly growing scale, beginning with the Industrial Revolution. And uh, we've seen, so far, we seem to have no end to this. Presumably, there's got to be a point where we know everything, but we're so far from achieving it that uh, we didn't worry about that for the time being. Uh, so the, the, this is, I think, one of the great contributions uh, that uh, Joseph Schumpeter has uh, brought to economics. And in a way, an innovation, by definition, is unpredictable. That's what you mean by an innovation. If you knew what was going to happen, you, you wouldn't uh, have it to... Uh, it wouldn't be an innovation, in a sense. You would already know it. And there's a, we have to have a language in talking about uncertainty. And the language we most conventionally use is that of probability. There are challenges to this. There are, there are a lot of arguments going over and over again in the history of statistics and in the history of uh, uh, economic analysis of the firm, uh, which you emphasize that, uh, and, uh, that maybe probabilities don't really reflect completely our the idea of uncertainty. But for the moment, let's just stick to that. It goes beyond anything I want to talk about today. We have a statement, we have uncertainties, and we can say, well, maybe there's going to be a way of, uh, of getting water, for example, to take our current problem of California, uh, without too much expense. We have ways now of creating water, of moving water from one place to another, getting it out of the skies, getting it, but above all, of getting it out of the oceans. Uh, and uh, make, make it into useful water. The, uh, but, we would, but possibly we can do it on a much cheaper basis if, we, if technologies improve or 
power gets much cheaper or something else uh, changes the picture. Um, now, probability is a very significant aspect. The one thing which makes the probability calculus so uh, useful is that uh, it is changed by experience. Um, for example, if you, uh, if, you, if you make one step toward a solution, uh, you may uh, alter for example, uh, the, the, chair, the probabilities of what? For example, the probability of successes of electric automobiles will depend on the development of batteries and the fact that there have been significant improvements in batteries has made a difference to the viability of electric automobiles. That's an example that's been around with us for well over a century. If you go back to 1900, there were about as many electric automobiles, about one third of the cars on the road were electric automobiles. The, the principle is, the, the, there's no difficulty in the principle once the electric motor was invented. The only problem with electric automobiles, which have obviously a lot of advantages, um, is, the, uh, is the, the fact that batteries have very limited capacity. You have to kind of keep on, and recharging a battery is a much more complex thing than, than time, more time consuming uh, item than uh, filling your tank up with gasoline. But various steps have been made. And it is very, I wouldn't it would be, not be surprised if in the uh, coming years we'll find radical improvements. Maybe, maybe other ways of storing electricity other than the present battery. But once you have, once you've made some improvement, you already have some ideas as to how to make further improvements. These are only probabilities, but they change the probabilities. A very classic example uh, of uh, changing probabilities, I think, was the development of the atomic bomb, the original atomic bomb, not the fusion, the fission bomb. Um, Consider it from the point of view of the Soviet Union. Um, there was clearly, there was clearly a theory, they knew the, if they had very good physicists, they knew very well the literature, and they knew that there was a possibility uh, by, by nuclear fission of creating explosive, large explosive forces. However, they, there were a lot of problems in going from there to a bomb, and they may or may not be solvable. So the probabilities might be considered fairly low of success. When the Americans, in fact, developed the bomb, one thing that was clear, it was possible to develop without any, without any kind of espionage, it was clear that it was uh, possible to develop a bomb, which means from the Russian point of view, that the probability of developing the bomb was, uh, the probability that they would develop the bomb was uh, considerably higher. In fact, of course, they were helped by espionage too. But there's certainly the idea they could, that if it was solvable by the Americans, they probably could solve it too, was a very reasonable hypothesis. And uh, the, the, in fact, the next step, the fusion bomb, uh, was uh, developed quite independently uh, by the Soviets, well, of course, the, uh, they as well as the Americans could see that was a possibility, and there were these technical difficulties. But uh, they could, uh, once they knew the A bomb could be made, the next step was the probabilities were increased for both. So, but so the probabilities are changed by experiences. There's what we call conditional probabilities, but different people had different experiences for lots of reasons we can, we can all go into. So we have the idea of the economic transactions now can take place with a future orientation between people who have different knowledges, different bodies of knowledge. And furthermore, they know they have different bodies of knowledge, ideally. Well, needless to say, this creates um, uh, problems in the dealing. It's what has been called lemons, you know, like from the classic example of a seller of a used car who presumably knows its defects better than the potential buyer. And therefore, the buyer rationally would re should react to take, a, to take account of that. And you can wind up that uh, there, is no, there could be no trade, uh, even though we know very well that there will be a mutually profitable trades. <clears throat> Uh, if you have uncertainty, a commodity that becomes valuable is insurance of some kind or another. 
right, some way of, take, of, of uh, spreading the risks. Uh, when I'm assuming a world in which uh, there is uh, diminishing marginal utility, as we say, that's to say, risk aversion, that people don't want to take risks. And the, in, a, in, a, in a world of uncertainty, one way of, of uh, improving everybody is to create, uh, is create is to spread the risk through insurance companies or something else, so that uh, what's, what's a large risk for a single individual may be made into a, may be averaged out and made into a smaller risk for each individual. Uh, and this, of course, is, works very well in some things like life insurance or property insurance. But insurance against business failure is not considered to be very reasonable. And of course, the reasons are obvious. It changes the incentives. Um, the uh, having sort of risks, but um, uh, if you could observe how much effort the individual has made, uh, then you would have a. Uh, here, I'm sorry. If you observe how much the individual made, you could have insurance conditional on that, but you can't. Even with property insurance, uh, there's always a, there are certain problems, and you see it in a bigger form with various kinds of health insurance. Uh, so we have limited, uh, we have the protection against uncertainties is limited by two factors. One is what's, uh, what's called moral hazard, when you cannot detect the motives um, of an individual. Their incentives are altered by insurance and they can't be, that can't be compensated for by observing actions in detail. The other is adverse selection. I just know more about uh, some risks than others, and the uh, and uh, uh, this creates uh, problems. The uh, classic example is that people who buy annuities um, live a good deal longer than people who buy regular life insurance. In other words, people somehow can predict a greater length of life in a way that probably isn't fully picked up by any of the physical examinations. Uh, given by the insurance companies. Uh, now, that may just be, a, uh, the, 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 whether, whether, that's a, whether that prevents the existence of insurance markets depends on the degree of moral hazard or adverse selection. Now, let me raise another question, which has been very bothersome in <clears throat> both theory and policy both the descriptive theory and policy. You speak of the future. What is the relevant future? Um, you know, the simplest model is uh, the one which people care about their own, what happens in their own lifetime. And then you have, uh, you, can, you can have a well-defined theory based on the fact that when I'm young, I'm worried about taking care of myself. When I'm old, and, uh, it, it depends on the uncertainties of my length of my life, depends on uncertainties in my future income and things like that. That's a fairly well-defined problem. Um, but, hello? Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, something seemed to fade here. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> um, the, who are the, uh, but in fact, in, in many, a very large part of the animal kingdom, including the human, humankind, uh, it's clear that parents care about children. Not uniform, but they. Uh, but on the whole, you expect parents to care about. You expect this family relationship. It's, and of course, you can give evolutionary reasons. A species which takes care of its young and builds, uh, protects them at least till they become adults is going to obviously have greater survival capacity than one that, uh, that ignores its children, although there are lots of species, of course, where, the, where there's no, the children are on their own. Uh, humans, of course, have an extremely long uh, case of dependency, and uh, this doesn't cease uh, with, adult, with the adulthood of the children. Um, but then you think about the future, you think, well, what about grandchildren? And uh, we can go on into this whole thing. And the question of formulating 
what is the appropriate model matters both for individual policy and to uh, for uh, one, one point I want to go into uh, emphasize a little bit social policy. Um, consider uh, questions where, where the present has long lasting effects. Um, the climate change being, of course, a very good illustration. Uh, what would essentially anything you put up in the air, say carbon dioxide at least, uh, will be there for 100 or 200 years. Um, so we're affecting a pretty long thing. And of course, we have to allow for the fact that the, the, the people put things you know, 50 years from now, it'll be uh, the effects will last 100 years from that and so forth. Furthermore, a lot of this, a lot of the, the effects are going to be embodied in capital goods. Uh, for example, if you're going to emphasize internal combustion engines for cars, you're going to be dependent on some kind of oil products. Um, and uh, we can, uh, and so then, so that you have engines which, based on that, the engines last, and therefore they create a demand for oil, not only in the present, but into the future for at least a while. And those, in turn, have effects of, of a long time. The most extreme example of long-range planning is, uh, however, not climate change, but even nuclear waste disposal. It's interesting, we do not have in this country, after, after what, 70 years, uh, a method of, uh, uh, an agreed method of permanent or long-run waste disposal. The reason, of course, is that the products, the, uh, the radioactive products, I should say, are going to be lasting for uh, hundreds of thousands of years uh, and uh, be with significant radioactive display. Uh, and indeed, in congressional law, it is required in considering any waste disposal uh, location uh, that um, the, the estimates be pushed for a million years. Now, this is inconceivably long. It's far longer than the existence of uh, Homo sapiens um, or even of, 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 of advanced hominids. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the whole species may not be around in a million years. Uh, or an asteroid may have destroyed us or Lots of other things may have happened, uh, not to mention the fact that uh, medical uh, progress may be very large so that radioactivity is not a significant health hazard at that point. But who knows? Uh, so it gets, it gets in the realm of the absurd when you some of these very long-run calculations. But the question is, do we want to take uh, a, a account of these, and how far into the future do we want to take? And that raises another very important ethical issue, uh, or maybe an issue of behavior, or maybe a, an issue of ethics. You can look at it in both ways. Namely, uh, how much should we take it kind of the future? Let's say we agree somehow, as we, I think we must, that mostly people will agree after a little thought, that you want to take account of the future, maybe even the indefinite future. Do we really want to take account of all future people equally? Or do we say, well, yeah, they're far away from us. Uh, we don't know much about them. Uh, we can't really have the same kind of concern we have for, let's say, the children over before us, right in front of us. Uh, that people that I argue by, among people I know and respect, there are sharp differences of opinion. Um, personally, I'm a little inclined to the judgment that we're in some mild way, we do discount the future. We do we count it for less, but there are uh, very able people um, who think, uh, no, no, it's a matter of uh, uh, a human being is a human being, whether it be now or a million years from now. Um, I just raised these issues to point out how <clears throat> these apparently simple points uh, uh, create complications. Uh, in thinking, and uh, uh, this becomes a real issue of um, uh, in, in determining policy, because the calculation of what we should do today 
to avoid climate change uh, is dependent on how much concern we have for the future. If we really believe the future uh, and, uh, and the individuals in the future should count equally with us, we probably should be drastically reducing our, our climate change. If our, our CO2 emissions and emissions of other uh, greenhouse gases. Um, if, um, uh, of course, there's no question we have to reduce, we should be reducing the matter under any logical method of thinking I can, th I can I'm aware of. But the statement, <clears throat> but how rapidly, <clears throat> or in another, in another terminology, what is the current social cost of <clears throat> carbon emissions does depend on how much we discount the future. Let me turn to one other aspect of the future. Um, and I must use another quote from Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre in his play, No Exit. Hell is others. Uh, what I mean is this. You know, that, uh, the, the fact that it's hell may be the wrong term here, of course, it could be heaven. Uh, uh, we don't really know. Um, that is, we are, as I've already emphasized, we are acting today on the basis of expectations about the future. If you know, some, We have some prices for the future, namely prices of securities, which um, uh, say bonds, um, which are promises to pay. And so they may go 20 or 30 years into the future. Or maybe sometimes there are exa longer examples, but they're rare. They're rare. Um, and uh, we, so we really are dependent on saying what we expect to happen is expectations about future developments. But among those future developments are what other people do. If there's a world where people are investing a lot in the future, uh, that would, under usual economic assumptions, would be a rather prosperous world and maybe therefore a good idea for us to invest. If others are not investing, demand may be low. Uh, the, uh, uh, Keynesian or neo-Keynesian uh, way of thinking. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, so it may not pay us to invest. In other words, our, uh, our expectation, we have, to, we have expectations about the actions of others. But the actions of others are governed by their expectations. Just as our actions are determined by our expectations, the, to, to predict the actions of others, we should know the expectations of others. So, but that means that my expectations really depend on your expectations, or should rationally depend upon them. And um, the, so uh, th this now, uh, as I say, the prices are so infrequent that they, and they're fairly short run anyway, they really don't give very much of a guide. They do. They would give a guide to what other people are thinking, but they don't give much of a guide. Uh, so we're depending on formulation. But then we have expectations. As you can see, the next step is we have expectations about expectations about expectations. Is the next thing. The, um, this is a point which has been emphasized, for example, both by John Maynard Keynes and by Oscar Morgenstern, John von Neumann's famous collaborator. Uh, this is a paper he wrote before he joined with von Neumann, in which he emphasized he was the head of the Austrian Business Cycle Research Institute and um, was concerned with forecasting, but then he realized, well, his forecasts were in effect forecasts of what other people were going to do and therefore in turn depended on their forecasts. And of course, his forecasts of the, of the Institute might affect other people's forecasts. And the question is, could you, uh, could you really have a world of complete foresight where now there is mathematically, you can show there is a set of expectations which would be compatible with the, uh, uh, the people will the, the supply and demand will be equal and the, uh, the economy will run smoothly. Um, uh, so the, but there will be one, but the question is how could anybody possibly know what it is? And he and Keynes in a famous, short but famous passage, uh, independently uh, pointed out this, and therefore that there's likely to be an instability in this. That the if people suddenly perceive that maybe they weren't ex 
their expectations about others' expectations about their expectations um, was faulty. The, the alteration could suddenly could suddenly change everything in, in a large and dramatic way. And this, of course, has been the uh, uh, the argument uh, for an argument in a way that uh, implicitly was used for a long time to argue for central planning. But it's clear that central planners will have almost the same problem in the sense that they have they, they are, after all, running a diverse economy and they will have very much the same problems as the, uh, the market would have. And so we have a world in which, although the mathematics or the theory of this has not really been developed, at least it gives rise to the idea of why we can have a world of such instability. The instability of the economic system in the modern sense is, of course, a product of capitalism. We, we have very few examples where beliefs played a big role. Uh, there, have been, there were a couple, actually, but there are very few uh, examples where, the, uh, where, where what you had is a sudden shift in beliefs. But right after the Napoleonic Wars, this became experienced for the first time. And uh, it was even by the middle of the 19th century, people were already pointing out uh, this uh, property of a decentralized market system that was subject to these failures, which, although there wasn't always stressed, depended upon the, f the fact that coordination of the future was not achievable within a price system. And therefore, the alternative, which is expectations, could give rise to inconsistent movements among the different parts, and so the periodic collapses, which we have seen. Now, that's a long way from saying we have any really good idea either how to predict them, which may be a paradox, or uh, how even to uh, understand how to react to them. Okay, this has been my aim, is just to set forth the role of future thinking and how in some ways it may not really be able to be surmounted, that there'll always be an unknowable element in any kind of economic or other social analysis. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken, for uh for your great talk and uh, for your enthusiasm and your willingness to participate in the uh, in the symposium, uh, I don't want to abuse your uh, kindness too much. But are you uh, okay if there are a couple of questions? Sure. Okay. So, questions. Ken, it's Vince Crawford. Hello. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, oh. You, you, at the end, you, you sort of said you, you were unwilling to speculate, but I want to press you a little bit more. In, in financial markets particularly, it seems like the volume of trade goes far beyond what would be supported by the usual fundamental reasons for trade, and even often to the point of speculative bubbles. If, if somebody told you you had to have a model of speculative bubbles within the next two months, what would you try first? Um, or is even zero sum trade? Forget about bubbles. Um, either one. <laughs> zero sum trade. I don't quite. Meaning, what you mean. meaning, meaning trade between people in a market, neither of whom has any genuine informational advantage, and neither of whom has any fundamental reason to wish to trade for smoothing purposes or something else like that. Hmm. Yes. Well, it's the, the, I have been thinking about the second one, that uh, the, if people just have different beliefs for whatever reason, let's say there's not enough evidence uh, uh, that, to come to an agreement. Uh, let me back up a bit. The usual view in statistics, which is not always true, by the way, but it's frequently true, is that even though you may start with different priors, if, you, if there's enough evidence, you'll tend to, your, your posteriors will tend to converge. The, uh, there's the, your probability is conditional on the evidence. And if you both have uh, access to the same evidence, uh, then, then uh, you, 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 people will tend to agree. 
And therefore, if they agree, of course, there's not going to be any trade in, in, in bets. Uh, but in fact, of course, if there's not much evidence, and if you have a changing economy, there never is going to be much evidence because the only relevant evidence is maybe the last few years, and that's not, for, that's not a long time series. The long time series is not really analyzable because there have been so many shifts. Um, uh, the, then you're going to have a situation where people uh, are, are going to engage in bets. And supposing, as you say, to follow your hypothesis, that there's no, uh, uh, that you are not interested in the risk from it. You, you, you have this, some random events that you don't care about, that don't influence your, your, your utility or your profitability at all. Nevertheless, if you have differences in beliefs, you're going to have bets. And uh, so you're going to have what is, in effect, an inefficient allocation. Now, that's not a dynamic thing. It doesn't lead to bubbles. It's just a statement that you can, you can wind up with a lot of betting. In other words, you can just call it uh, buying and selling securities um, without any real social gain involved. And of course, if you assume that the trading itself takes resources, you have a net result. See, one of the one of the, one of the, the point you raise has been bothering me is that the, the sheer size of the financial sector is not explicable in any general equilibrium terms. General equilibrium, you say, I want to borrow, you want to lend, uh, we get together and lend. Somehow, we need to have intermediaries. But not only do you have intermediaries, but the profits of the financial sector are 30 to 40 percent of all the profits in the whole uh, economy. Now, that's a very large financial sector. Furthermore, there's uh, a, presumably a big absorption of human capital at the same time. So uh, there, there is what would strike one uh, from a, certainly starting from a general economic point of view is a, uh, uh, a tremendous burden on the economy. A very large, you know, this is a pretty large sector. A very large amount of GDP is devoted just to getting together and uh, certainly, uh, at a, uh, a, a casual view, if you one looks at, say, 208 or uh, and, and previous similar examples, that this financial system is, is far from far from being productive, can be counterproductive because you get well. Yeah, I mean, you understand these securities are linked in various ways, um, through collateral, the use of collateral, and uh, a collapse. Frequently produce is uh, uh, let's say there's declining prices, which could be you know it initially is is removing uh, some kind of uh, disequilibrium. It may in fact have a cumulative effect, and uh, the uh, this has been observed a number of times. And uh, in fact, if you look at the long term, the failure of long term capital management in uh, uh, was it 1998. Um, very strange. I mean, why was any bank, ba your banks were supplying something like 93% of all the uh, uh, investments by LTCM. Only about 7% was put up by the investors. The question is, why would a, would a bank lend that money? They knew that a small uh, uh, adverse shift would wipe them out. Well, of course, they had evidence that LTCM did very well and you could you can argue they can't uh, uh, they take bets, but their bets are uh, limited by, by limited liability. And uh, the, <clears throat> uh, uh, the result is that, uh, you, uh, that you get it. Now, the question, of course, is why the lenders don't recognize that to begin with. Uh, and that's uh, a puzzle. But since it's a general equilibrium thing, it's just too hard to work out. Uh, there's no way of really working out what the effects are going to be. And uh, you can see you can easily have big misperceptions. I think that's a rather lengthy answer, with a lengthy non-answer to uh, your question. Vince. Very helpful. Thank you very much. Roberto, here's the microphone. Okay. A question from Leon Cooper again. Yeah. Okay. I give my best to Leon. And uh, thanks, thanks very much. It was wonderful, wonderful talk. Sorry you couldn't have come here, but this well, is second best. Yeah. Uh, I have a comment that's probably peripheral 
to what you're saying, but you did mention nuclear wastes. And uh, as you indicated, the idea of trying to put them away for a million years or even 250,000 years is totally absurd. It's totally unnecessary. It is extraordinarily easy to put them away for a thousand years. There's no problem whatsoever. And since uh, you were discussing the effect of the future on the present, uh, we have no way of knowing what the economic value of those wastes might be in not only a thousand years, but perhaps a hundred years. I mean, in fact, one can easily imagine uses for them right now, which is a lot better than keeping them in swimming pools around the reactors. But mm -hmm. uh, here you have something that is more a political problem than a technical problem. There are all kinds of technical solutions, but politically we are incapable of doing anything. And I think it's a wonderful example of how fear of the future, the imagined future, the future far too distant for us to predict is influencing our behavior today. And so the idea of building that monstrosity under Yucca Mountain and worrying about whether water is going to get there in 250,000 years is just too ridiculous to contemplate. I know it's peripheral to your argument, but I just wanted to mention it, and I wanted to say hello to you, and thank you very much for talking to us. Oh, thank you very much, Liam. It's great to hear from you again. Uh, let me ask you one question. Uh, what, uh, what, what about the safety of the radioactors from uh, uh, diversion? You know, the, the, it can be stolen. <laughs> uh, but, but that has been, uh, that is a concern. That was a concern in the uh, uh, New START agreements. Are you and, talking uh, about the reactors or the waste? The, the waste, the waste. Well, you can encase them. In, them. You can yeah. encase them in concrete containers. Uh, and uh, will make it essentially impossible to steal them. I mean, it's, you know, anything, anything is conceivable, I guess, but uh, that would be pretty hard. There would be, if you were trying to steal something that could be destructive, you could steal a lot of other things. That would be much easier. I mean, it, just as an example, uh, if you put those in concrete containers, the containers are not very ra radioactive because it doesn't get out, but they do get hot. Ah. And you can use that heat to heat boilers and things of that kind. And in fact, we could use it to uh, drive the electricity system or the heating system at Brown. And I once told this to Ruth Simmons, and uh, I said, and she said, well, uh, that might be possible technically, but it would be a political problem. And I said, well, Ruth, you're the one who solves political problems. That's right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Leo. Uh, Ken, here is Soren Estrail. Uh, oh, sorry. Delighted to see you, and we're excited uh, to have your lecture as the grand finale of this um, von Neumann series. So I have a question for you. Um, I remember fondly our time in Romania two years ago, and yes. when we talked, uh, you mentioned to me that um, economics is as unpredictable as the weather. Remember <laughs> you made that comment? Yes, yes. And here we are at von Neumann Symposium, and Johnny uh, thought that by now we could actually control the weather, not only predict. And last he was, I didn't know. He, I didn't know he believed in controlling the weather. I think he was uh, hoping. And last night, Freeman Dyson uh, said that von Neumann didn't know about chaos at that time. Uh, was invented that he was not aware about the phenomenon. But as a theme, can we? Um, control the future? Can the present at least control parts of the future? Well, we, yeah, I think the, the answer is yes. To another, I think th there are lots of examples. Uh, if you look at the development of the United States, for example, in the early, uh, say, from 1800 to 1850, there's a lot of emphasis on what they call internal improvements, essentially infrastructure to make the country, uh, you know, make commerce av easily available over longer and longer distances. In the early days, it was canal building. <clears throat> and this was a public enterprise, by the way. Uh, the Erie Canal being the most famous, but there were lots of, lots of others. Then, of course, the railroad was the successor of that. And again, while that was more private enterprise than the, the canals, it was, uh, it was uh, certainly the transcontinental railroad was greatly facilitated by public policy. 
So they, they, and this, of course, they, once you have a rail, you determine in a lot of ways where people live, where people work, uh, so that you are controlling the future uh, in, in many ways. Um, of course, we also uh, uh, public policy in different ways. We, uh, we uh, most, uh, in a good part of our period, for example, foreign trade was kind of restricted by high tariff policies. Um, we, uh, the, the manufacturers, particularly, wanted uh, control over their, uh, and then of course agri later agricultural interests, but originally with manufacturers more, uh, wanted to prevent uh, British imports from wiping us out, and uh, because the British was a more advanced country, and uh, this was uh, you know right right from the beginning of the country, Alexander Hamilton urged this right away as uh, 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 Secretary of the Treasury, the first Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and that certainly promoted manufacturing in the United States. A lot of economists would have said that we would have been better off without it, but whatever it is, it altered the future. Uh, so we do uh, uh, didn't point out how the Manhattan Project affected the future, maybe not entirely uh, uh, d deliberately, but a lot of it was. So the, 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 the use of power was recognized immediately. Um, and uh, I did not, uh, it, it seems to me we have, but of course, there's always the unknown. So things that may have set out to be useful and correct turn out to be the hampering. So I'm afraid both, the trouble is both are true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I got one more question. Hi, Ken, thank you. Um, my name is Jack Fanning. I'm a junior professor here yeah. at Brown. Um, my question was in regards to your comments early on about, uh, in particular, about innovation. And I was wondering if you could, you could say something more about uh, predictions about things that you can't even conceive and whether I mean you you kind of alluded to it when you were talking about innovations uh, but in some sense do you, do you think that our our models of of, of the future can be improved upon uh, to, to model this idea that we can't even conceive of some of some of the future well, that I think uh, uh, you know, I think you're like where a lot of things you can predict um, something. Yeah, but you're like to predict that if you put a lot of research into climate adaptation models, right? You know, supposing you assume the climate is going to get worse, you want to have different crops, you want to change uh, the heating systems, you know, that you want to adapt. And uh, very little doubt that if you put a lot of effort into it you're going to get results. You don't know exactly what the results are going to be, but you're going to get them. But there's no question things happen that nobody uh, expected. Uh, if, even when the steam engine was developed, it wasn't immediately obvious you're going to have rails. So it took a little while to recognize you could use a steam engine to run a boat or to run a, uh, uh, a, 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 transport, a, a surface transportation. Um, so uh, and, uh, the, uh, the, the, there's, uh, I think, I, let me persuade you, whatever you do had better be robust to the, to the unexpected. You don't want to get, involved, get too committed to something, even though it looks, it looks right, without allowing for the possibility of something that's going to come along that you didn't expect. I mean, Discovering America, for example, was a rather uh, startling event. To take a, take an example, going a little, a little further back, was something that nobody expected. You know, the, uh, the all they knew was there's a big ocean from between us and uh, Asia. Uh, nobody. Uh, the, the only question was how big it, how big the Earth was, uh, and uh, Columbus was wrong, of course. Uh, he thought the Earth was small enough to to. to uh, uh, to, to be able to uh, sail there. Um, luckily, it turned out to be something in between. And so there's a big, that, that, in other words, you have to have a society in which you're never so committed 
that the unexpected can't be made use of. And uh, uh, that, the, you're going to say, well, I don't, I don't know how to put it, but uh, this kind of robustness is something which is a little hard to analyze, a little hard to place, but there are ways of looking at it that way. The, the so-called min-max approach it's from game theory, but it's, uh, it, it also applies to uh, behavior in the face of, uh, uh, of uncertainty. Max min, I should say, really. So uh, I, th I think the answer is in terms of real uncertainties. Luckily, most new, big new things come and start small, so you begin, you begin to have an idea that they're going to happen. And uh, uh, but even now, you know, we were, if we're thinking about sources of energy. You know, let's say we, let's say we commit ourselves to the idea we want to get carbon emissions down well to zero, really. Um, the um, uh, that, that you want to uh, uh, the, the the question of w what what energy system is going to work best? I think you you want to keep uh, allowing for some novel idea that we're not thinking of now. Hello. Okay. Thank okay. you, Ken. Uh, I think that was the last question. Let me just close. Since you mentioned uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, let me close the whole thing with, with a joke. I don't know if you know this joke that uh, they say that the first economist was Christopher Columbus. Have you heard that? No, I have not heard that one. So, and, and the reason, there are three reasons for this. So, uh, number one, uh, he had no idea where he was going. Uh -huh. Number two, uh, he didn't even know where he was even after he got there. Uh -huh. And number three, a large portion of the enterprise was financed by the government. So, uh, so <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Ken, and uh, great to have you. And hope to see you soon. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank everybody. Bye.